GW Center for Excellence in Public Leadership gave me the opportunity to present my women's leadership uh, program there. They wanted to see if by giving women specific leadership skills and behaviors that were unique to them and build their confidence and courage with all kinds of new ways of doing things in an intensive three-day program to see if we could move women forward faster into positions of power and influence. And Kate became a great example of a woman unleashed. <laughs> and you'll hear about it. Now, what you need to know about Kate is that she's all, before that, she was already a, a powerful woman. Uh, Kate had an important role at the Department of Justice at the time that I met her and she went into the program. She was an advocate, a counselor, and a legal advisor for victims. Specifically, she advised on cases like the Madoff investment scandal the Boston Marathon bombing, and the Pulse nightclub shooting. Pretty impressive, huh? But she had a different vision. She discovered she had another vision. And today, less than three years later, she is the president of her own business, Blackbird, which provides training and consultation on issues of trauma and victimization to all kinds of organizations. And she's the author now of her own book, The Empathetic Workplace, which was published by one of the top five publishing houses in the United States. That's HarperCollins. Uh, and the book is going to be released in about two weeks. But by the way, you can pre-order it now on Amazon. I'm mm -hmm. waiting for my copy because I don't want to have to, I know they're going to run out, so. So we've been talking about celebrating Kate and the publishing of her first book uh, since HarperCollins signed her. Uh, and tonight, finally, we all get to celebrate together and we also get the inside scoop on Kate and a few of her brilliant insights that she shares in her book. And we all know that we need this more than ever in today's multiple crisis world. Empathy is no longer a soft skill. It's a required leadership skill at organizations today. Mm -hmm. And just because we're women doesn't mean we know exactly how to deliver it. So it's my pleasure to welcome Catherine Manning, my friend, and the author of The Empathetic Workplace. Yay! Uh, yay! <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. I'm getting a little teary, you know, as you were talking. It's, it's really so, it feels like a full circle moment, you know, because I stood with you in that room and kind of came out with this is my vision. And now here we are um, just a couple years later and it's really, um, I feel like it's happening. So um, I'm so grateful to this community for everything that I have gotten in terms of substantive knowledge, you know, actual things that I didn't know how to do that I did that I learned through this community. Some of the people on this call, you know, helped me learn things that I didn't know how to do um, as well as the, um, the community that we built, you know, Leslie, you are just an incredible um, role model and cheerleader for building your own entourage. And I feel like this community has been so incredibly supportive to me. Um, you know, guys, I wish you knew all the things that <laughs> Leslie and Katerina and Ina have done for me behind the scenes. So I, just one little example, I was uh, selected to speak at South by Southwest last year. And, you know, obviously it didn't happen, but I was really, really nervous because this is such a big thing and I'm a government lawyer and I'm not cool enough for South by Southwest and all that. Leslie spent all this time with me. I mean, she listened to my talk. She gave me pointers just, just in her spare time, which she has none of. She gave of herself and her expertise to help me improve. So, you know, just real substantive support um, as well as community. And then the confidence that I got, um, the 
confidence to dream bigger, you know, beyond what I knew already and thought I could do. This community and this program gave me um, the confidence to dream even bigger than I thought I could. So I'm so grateful for that. Um, I know some of you, but I don't know all of you. So I just want to give you a little bit of like my own background and my own journey to where I got, because I think it might help you um, to kind of place what I'm doing in context. So um, I grew up in the DC area. I'm from this area. And I think there are kind of two things from my childhood that are sort of formative to where I am today. One is that I think when you grow up in the DC area, you're surrounded by people who are trying to change the world in some way. You know, people come to DC because they're really passionate about politics or the environment or the economy or whatever it is. And so I grew up with this sense that if you feel passionately about something, you can make a difference in it. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is that one of my kind of early family experiences was um, growing up in a family where there was domestic violence. So one of my very first memory is actually my father hitting my mother um, when I was three years old. And fortunately, my mother had the resources and the wherewithal to be able to leave that abusive relationship. And I didn't grow up in an abusive household, but that was obviously a formative experience. And when I went away to college, one of the first things I did was start to volunteer on the domestic violence hotline. Um, the local hotline there in uh, my college town. And through that experience, I learned very quickly how um, difficult it is for victims in the legal system. Um, and I saw the way that um, victims were not able to get their interests met. And I thought, I really want to go to law school. Um, so I decided to go to law school. I ended up going to a firm for a few years, but always my interest was getting back to victim work. And so in 2004, I had the opportunity to go to the Justice Department. And there I was the my title was senior attorney advisor um, for the victim witness program. But what it meant basically was I was the DOJ expert on victim rights. So I was the legal advisor on how we were supposed to work with victims in cases. But one of the things that became clear over my time there was the legal advice was only a tiny, tiny little fraction of the actual advice that I was giving. And more often it was questions of ethics and morality and what is, what is it that we know that people who have been victimized need. Um, and so over the course of those years, I started to develop just a few touchstones of things that I knew were really important um, for victims. Let me just give you one example, just to put a little bit of um, shape to that. Um, so one example of something that I learned in my time at DOJ came from a case where I got a phone call from a prosecutor who had a, a case where there was an infant who had died in a federal daycare facility. Um, and it was a little boy who was three months old and he had died and the parents were furious with the prosecutors for not filing charges against the daycare provider because they were convinced that she had shaken their baby and that's why he had died. Um, what they didn't know but the prosecutors did is that there was a video. So there was an actual, there was a webcam in the, or you know, a nanny cam, I guess, in the daycare facility. And on the camera, you can see, you see the crib um, with the baby in it. You see the daycare provider come in and she's washing bottles and she's right in front of the camera. So picture her, you know, she's kind of where I am washing the bottles. And then behind her is the baby and you see the crib and you see the baby and he's kind of like, you know, flailing around and you see him lift up a blanket and pull it over his face. And she doesn't see any of it, right? She's just washing the bottles, washing the bottles, and then she leaves. Um, but on this recording, you can see the moment that their child died. So just devastating. I got the phone call to me was, should we show them the tape? Right? They're, they're calling us and they're mad that we didn't file charges. They don't realize there's no way that she shook the baby, we know what happened. So should we show them to, to explain why we're not filing charges? Now that's not really a legal question, right? I mean, the, the legal answer is you don't have to, right? <laughs> but that's not really the, the answer to that question. And so what that conversation taught me is something that has carried through to me this to this day, which is that, um, one of the hardest things about being a victim is the loss of control, right? You have so little information sometimes about what happened. Um, 
and no control over what happened. You know, you're driving home from work, you get hit by a drunk driver and suddenly you spend the next six weeks in the hospital. You didn't do anything wrong, right? This is something that happened to you. Um, and that loss of control is very, very difficult. It, it causes almost like a cognitive dissonance. We like to believe we're in control of our surroundings. And so one of the things that I've learned is that an important thing we can do for people who are going through some sort of traumatic experience is to give them as much control back as possible. So what do we do? We give them information and we give them choice. Information, there's a tape out there. Broad, high level, this is what the tape shows. Choice, do you wanna see the tape? Do you want a copy of the tape? Do you wanna show it to somebody else, a clergy member, family member? Do you wanna just hold on to it and make a decision later, right? So those are some of the types of lessons that I learned over working with victims all these years. And the thing that was fascinating to me is that it didn't really matter what kind of crime it was. So a fraud victim had the same sense of loss of control and same need for information as somebody who had just lost a child or somebody who was a human trafficking victim or a terrorism victim, same kinds of things that we all needed um, when we went through a traumatic experience. And then the other thing that was fascinating to me is it wasn't just crime victims who needed that. I was using those same skills with my coworkers. So I would, you know, I was like the person, and maybe some of you are this person too, where everybody who is mad about something would walk through my office door, right? <laughs> or you're upset or whatever. So I would have, um, you know, a fellow attorney in the office just furious about the way his boss had spoken to him in a meeting and just, you know, pacing around my office, so angry, so angry. And I found I was using the same skills to calm him down that I would use on a hotline with a domestic violence victim. You know, it's the exact same skills. And I realized these are just things that we all need when we're going through crisis. And so that's when I started to think about um, the need for a fuller conversation about how do we support each other through times of trauma. Um, and it was really, uh, for me, it was the Me Too movement that kind of pushed me um, a little bit out of, the, out of the nest at DOJ when Me Too kind of shot across the culture in 2018. Um, I saw all these phenomenal conversations happening around how do we support survivors, um, you know, and what is it that uh, we should be doing. But one of the things that frustrated me about Me Too is I felt like Me Too did a phenomenal job at saying to survivors, it's okay to share your story. Um, but where it fell down was teaching the rest of us how to listen. And we would see time and again where somebody would kind of work up the wherewithal and the, um, the courage to share a story and then instantly be met with, was she crazy? Is she making it up? Is she getting paid? Something like that. And, and not even a moment of, are you okay? You know, thank you for sharing that. And um, I knew because of my time at DOJ that it's possible to conduct a, an investigation of the facts um, in a respectful and supportive way. And I just thought, you know, I know that people want to do this, but maybe they don't know how. And that's some, some place that I can help. And then honestly, it was Me Too was happening around the same time that I went through the Executive Women's Leadership Program. And that also was a little push of, you know, there is a role for me. There is a, a voice that I have that could be amplified and maybe shed some light on, on some of these issues that we're struggling with as a society. And that's ultimately when I decided to start working on the book and started making my plan to leave DOJ. So I left in 2019 and it's been just an amazing ride as you can imagine because the book started off as a Me Too book and um, then suddenly, you know, and so part of what I did, especially in the beginning of the book, a lot of it is kind of explaining to people there is trauma in your workplace and you should understand how it's affecting your workplace. And then we had coronavirus and we had George Floyd and we had environmental disaster and now storming the Capitol and everything else. And suddenly everybody is very, very aware that trauma is out there and it's affecting us at work. And so I feel like you know, it's been a long journey, but I feel like I'm arriving at just the right moment at just the right time. So I'm very, very grateful about where I've ended up. Yeah, we need you now more than ever, I think. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a few more questions so we can pull some more out of you. And if anybody has any questions, please put them up in the chat and we will do our best to have uh, 
Catherine answer them. And also I wanted to mention that when we finish, uh, I think we're gonna go for you know about a half an hour or so longer uh, with questions and hearing from Catherine. And then we're gonna actually break up into groups using the breakout function and put you into groups, which is something we do constantly in the Executive Women's Leadership Program. We, we discuss everything. Um, now that we're online, because we, when, when Catherine was there, we were all in person. Now we're online <laughs> completely. And believe it or not, it works well, works <laughs> well, much to my surprise. So, um, but anyway, so put your questions in the chat and then we will at the end break up into groups. I hope you can stay because you'll get to talk to each other. And also uh, Catherine is gonna make the rounds and jump into every group. So you'll get to meet her and talk to her directly as well. So let's just start with this. Let's start with the, the basics that I know this is one of the things that you share in your book. Um, and you really talk about the action steps, the steps for responding to trauma in the workplace. What do we do when it happens to somebody else? Yeah, thanks for that. It's, um, the book tries to be very much um, a practical tool. So the goal is to give you really practical advice. There's, you know, a little bit of kind of theory in there and let's talk about psychology, you know, psychological studies and, and some to give you some understanding for why these are the steps. But most of all, what I really want is for people to have practical tools. Um, first off, just a very quick um, background. Um, one of the things that I know makes it difficult to respond well to a story of trauma um, is the way that trauma affects the brain. So just very, very quickly, um, when we are going through a situation that our brains deem is dangerous, two things happen that are relevant. One is we get a surge of adrenaline, right? This is the kind of fight or flight response. So a little surge of adrenaline in case we have to fight somebody off or run away. And then the parts of our brain that are less useful for a fight or flight um, get muted. And most importantly, our rational decision-making part of the brain gets a little bit muted when we're going through a, an experience that we view as dangerous, or really that our kind of lizard brain views as dangerous. Very, very, you know, great thing if we're out and, you know, possibly going to be attacked by a bear, that's really, really a good thing. Um, but sometimes because, um, we can, we can sense danger times that are not necessarily, um, physical danger, right? And so sometimes that can cause a little bit of problem. And in particular, it can cause problems around how we communicate when we're going through a traumatic experience. So just to understand that there are some challenges around communicating around stories of trauma. And one piece of it is because of the experience of the person in trauma. And then the other thing to understand is um, empathy, right? So we have emotional contagion. When somebody, um, when I'm interacting with somebody, I there is a part of my brain that kind of lights up in the same way that their brain is lighting up. I start to feel the same kinds of emotions that they're feeling. So if I am, you know, if I see somebody across the way who's laughing really hard, I might start to laugh too, even if I have no idea what they're laughing about. And that's because of this kind of part of my brain that mirrors the emotions of others. So um, if it's laughing, that's great, right? But if it's somebody who's going through a trauma response, that can be difficult. So it's important to understand that it can be sometimes a little bit challenging um, to respond well in a moment of, of uh, disclosure of a story of trauma. And so that's why I came up with these very simple five steps. And I even gave you an acronym because I want to make it as easy as possible to remember it if you're starting to have that kind of adrenaline surge and the muting of your um, your complex decision making. So the five steps are number one, listen. Okay, so listening is active listening. And there's a lot of advice in the book on how to do this and um, both how to remain present for the person and control your own response, that same kind of contagion, make sure that you can manage that and, and um, be able to stay present for the person. So step one is listen, step two is acknowledge. And this is where I think a lot of um, conversations kind of fall apart. Um, often we are good at sitting still and listening. We won't interrupt. We, we know to do that. Um, but we have a tendency to want to jump to a solution 
Um, just, oh, I know exactly the person you need to call, right? Or the same thing happened to my sister and here's what she did and she was just great. Um, I think that is a um, wonderful impulse, right? We want, we want to help the person. Um, but the challenge is we really need to feel acknowledged before we can even hear you. One of my favorite quotes is from um, Theodore Roosevelt and he said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So acknowledge is just a reminder, just before you jump to anything else, take just a second to acknowledge the story that was shared with you. And acknowledgement can be very easy, just thanks for sharing that, I had no idea, or God, that sounds really hard, or that must've been really scary, right? Whatever is sincere, you know, you, whatever it is you're sincerely feeling. So listen, acknowledge, and then you can move on to sharing information. And this is, you know, remember that epiphany I had over the, the um, instance with the videotape in the daycare center. So sharing information is really important. And that can be anything from facts as we know them to um, process going forward to our values. So sharing some information is a way, um, it does kind of two things. One is it gives them back some measure of control. And two is it actually kind of shifts the energy of the conversation. So it gets people in the frame of reference to be able to hear from you and that, that's important. So um, listen, acknowledge, share, and then step four is empower with resources. Um, this step I really feel like is as important for ourselves as it is for the person in trauma. I don't know about you, um, but I struggle a little bit with boundary setting sometimes, you know, and in particular, when I started off doing domestic violence work, I just like, if I, it was really good that I lived in a tiny apartment, because I would have just had everybody move in with me. Right. I mean, I just wanted it to be um, like, I would have had a house full of women and children, right? Like, uh, I'm just going to handle this for you. Um, it's important that we not do that for a couple reasons. One, like we will just wear ourselves into the dust, right? Like we, we physically can't do that and mentally, emotionally can't do that. But also it's really important for the other person that we not do that. We need them to take the steps to heal themselves. We can't take those steps for them. It, this is their journey. This is their path to walk. Um, so what we can do is give them some tools along the way. And what are those tools? Things like um, if you have EAP at your organization, EAP is great. Make sure they know about it and that they know that it's free and confidential. Um, there are, um, it, it can be really helpful for people to understand some of the security options at your work. Sometimes that's relevant. I would just advise all of you, if you don't know right now who you would call if somebody said, um, my ex-husband is scaring me and he's hanging out outside the building. If you don't know who you would call, figure that out and put it in your phone as soon as you can, just because you never know when you're going to need it. Right. So just keep that information handy. Um, there's also a lot of other kind of community resources. And if you go to my website, which is blackbird-dc.com, I have a little one pager of resources, things like the suicide hotline, where to go to report child abuse, just general resources that I think everybody should know. Um, so that was step four, empower with resources. And step five is return. And return, I really think of as kind of two things. One is you return literally to the person afterward and check in, like, how are you doing? Um, do you, you know, do you need more resources, different resources? Did you forget what I told you, you know? So check in with them again. And also I think of it as a return to ourselves um, because this is hard work. It's hard to stay present for people in trauma. And it's really important that we prioritize self-care and guard against compassion fatigue. So there's um, some information in the book about steps we can take to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves along the way. So I don't know if you caught those five steps. It's listen, acknowledge, share, empower, and return. And the acronym is LASER. And the way to remember it when you get that surge of adrenaline is that your goal is to stay laser focused on the person in trauma and what it is that they need. Very helpful. Yes. Very helpful. So here's a question for you, uh, Catherine. You know, with the COVID virus and people are, you know, working from home again, right? And they're, and it looks like it may continue for quite a while. So the workplace and family life have been thrust together. And I'm wondering what kind of trauma you are finding people are experiencing with this kind of situation. And how can employers or managers really stay alert to these problems to know that they're going on? 
Yeah, it's um, it's this um, really difficult confluence right now. So I think the trauma is happening on multiple levels, right? So there are a lot of people who are experiencing trauma in their home life, and that could be they have COVID, somebody they love has COVID. It could be, um, you know, we've seen a, a really um, frightening rise in domestic violence and child abuse in this time. Um, it could be, you know, kind of more common experiences like trying to manage homeschooling and jobs and everything else and feeling completely run ragged. So there's a lot of trauma just in our in our little personal spheres. Then there's also organizational trauma. I mean, a lot of organizations have had to completely pivot how they do business. Some organizations have either had to severely cut back or even close their doors. Um, and so that's created kind of an organizational trauma. Um, and then obviously we're experiencing societal trauma right now. I mean, you know, I, I gotta say those images of the Capitol um, with smoke and, and people kind of breaking windows and running. I mean, to me, I feel a sense of, of trauma from that, from those images. And I feel like as a nation, we're going through a collective trauma, both from that and from 400,000 COVID deaths. So um, it's been a really, really difficult time right now. And then at the same time, we're more distant than we ever have been, right? We are um, communicating through screens. We aren't getting the energy flow that we normally would. You know, I was talking with a woman who is, you know, she's the head of her team. And she said, normally I would go into a team meeting and, you know, we're all sitting around a conference room. And she said, and I knew instantly, like something's going on with Tim. I don't know what it is, but something's wrong and I need to check in with him. She said, I can't do that anymore. You know, I see little tiny faces on the screen. I don't, I don't get the same um, read of my team that I used to. And so I think we have to be even more intentional um, so a couple things. One, I think um, prioritize the check-in. What this woman is doing is now she has a one-on-one -on -one check in with every one of her team members. And some of them, it might be a just five minute, everything good. Like let's just, you know, talk about our dogs for a minute. Um, and some it might be a little bit longer, but just one-on-one -on -one check in with everybody. Um, sometimes she'll even say, like, why don't you just get up from your desk and we're gonna go for a walk together? You know, we'll be on the phone and we're both gonna be moving and outside and getting some fresh air as we're having this check-in. Um, a lot of people are telling me that they are doing more team meetings, which is one of those things I got to say when I was at DOJ, those like, you know, team meetings used to drive me crazy because I felt like nothing got done. But what I'm hearing now is that people crave those kinds of interactions, that they want to have just a like 15 minute at five o'clock on Mondays where we all just lay eyes on each other. And we don't necessarily even talk about work. We just hear what everybody did over the weekend and we have just a quick check-in. Um, I think we're all craving those kinds of interactions. You know, I was speaking with a friend who is a, she's a trauma therapist. Her name is Megan Reardon Jarvis. And she's really, really um, very talented. But one of the things she said to me that resonated is she said, you know, in the before times, she said she had a client who came in one time who just came in so happy into her office and she said what you know why are you in such a good mood today and she said I don't really know but you know I just I, I went and got coffee this morning and I had kind of a nice interaction with the person you know at the counter and she gave me a free donut donut just to be nice and then um, you know as I was walking over here somebody um, just told me what a cute skirt I had on and I don't know I just feel good <laughs> and you know, as Megan pointed out, like those are the kinds of interactions we, we aren't getting anymore. You know, we don't have just those little easy, like, hey, I see you, you know, I, I, I see and acknowledge you and think you're great. Like, I'm just going to smile at you and, and tell you that's a really cute skirt. Like those kinds of things that actually are pretty important. And so what I'm trying to do now is build in more of those little like one-off, like, texting memes to my friends, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many, <laughs> how many Bernie <laughs> little memes we've been exchanging by text. I'll look down, I have 25 new texts. I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> but just those little tiny, I mean, it's such a like silly thing, but just for a second, it gives you a little bit of a lift. Like, oh, hey, this person is thinking of me. And I feel a little bit better from, 
because of it. So that's something I think we all can do. And obviously, you know, leaders can do it. You don't have to be a leader to do that, right? This is something where we all can lead um, by creating an environment where we demonstrate that we value each other. So I think those are the things that we all should be working on being intentional about right now, like just finding little moments of joy and connection and also opening up and showing that it is okay to talk about the hard stuff. And this is another thing where um, you can model it, right? Like just starting off like um, a team meeting or something with like, wow, this was a, a rough weekend, man. Those, those images of the Capitol are really, really hard and I'm struggling right now. I'm feeling really angry or I'm feeling really, you know, depressed or defeated or whatever it is, you know, making it okay to have those conversations um, so that people know that they're not alone and that it's okay to talk to you too. If you are showing that you are willing to open up, you're modeling to them both this is how we process this, this extraordinary event and I am a safe person to talk to. And that is, um, sometimes really can make all the difference when people know that it's okay to talk to you about something because you don't know what people are going through. Um, and then the final thing is wherever possible, make those resources, you know, that we talked about a little bit ago, just make them universally known because just the domestic violence example, domestic violence is a lot more common than people think. And it is, you know, at every kind of area of society. So don't think, you know, oh, you know, there's nobody I work with who's experiencing that. The chances are that there is somebody in your life right now who's experiencing domestic violence. So just make sure that people know about the resources out there. Like, hey, everybody, I don't know if you know that we this we have a phenomenal um, security team here at work. Here's, you know, the guy's email address. You could even use me. You could say I was just at this presentation and she was talking about how it's so important that we all know the security options. So I'm just gonna make sure everybody knows this is Joe. He's our security guy. This is his phone number. This is his email. Put it in your phone right now, you know? Or, hey, did you know that we have a great EAP program here and, um, Let's have them come in and do a little presentation. Um, just because we don't know who needs what, um, talking about it with everybody, I think, um, is really, really helpful. And then we'll see, you know, if people are able to access them. I think that's um, the key is making sure that they know about it and then letting them take the next steps themselves. Very helpful, Catherine. I, I noticed in the chat, we got uh, more than one question that relates pretty much to a similar thing. And that is, what do you do when leaders in your organization are either inherently not empathetic, um, paren, average white guy syndrome, don't understand or grasp what trauma is possible because it's never happened to them or their family, and all the other reasons. So if it's the leader in your organization, what do you do to yeah. get them to be more responsive? Yeah, it's tricky. And, you know, sometimes it's not just not empathetic, sometimes it's toxic, right? Like they're, they're actually affirmatively um, creating a difficult environment. So there's a few things. One, I think it's important, always self care, you have to take care of yourself and, you know, recognize that you don't need to, um, you know, it, this is not your sole mission to change your entire organization, right? So take care of yourself and and just water your little plants right around you, right? So that's one thing is just recognize your own boundaries and take care of yourself along the way. Um, one of my favorite things, though, is to um, to make a case for why a good response to trauma helps everybody. So that's, I mean, you know, as I said, the book starts out this way. The book starts out just kind of making my legal case for why you should care about this. I mean, I was, I was the DOJ expert on victims. <laughs> so let me be clear, not everybody at DOJ thinks that victims are kind of central to the mission, right? So I have a lot of background with this. And one of the things that I have found to be effective um, is to explain it in the terms that will resonate with them. So it's not, um, we do this because, you know, I, I think for a lot of people, of course, you want to have a good response to trauma. There's not a question about that. Um, but for some people, they don't really see that as a relevant thing for them. Um, so one of the things that I have found really helpful is to cite 
the Google study. So for a couple reasons, one, it's a really great study. And two, because it has the name Google, all of those guys, those like, you know, kind of macho guys are like, oh, Google, like it must be serious and true, right? So here, I'm just gonna give you a quick rundown on the Google study. So Google did a study of teams. They were trying to figure out what made for an effective, healthy, productive, creative team. And because they're Google, they have every you know, possible um, configuration of team and they're able to do a ton of research on it. And so they looked at all these teams company-wide to try to figure out what made some teams really, really healthy and productive and others not. And they looked at things like, um, teams where everybody had a similar background or everybody had a very different background, teams where um, they socialized outside of work or where they didn't, teams where they had one really strong leader or many strong leaders or no strong leaders, and they couldn't find anything that would um, that would explain why some teams were more effective than others. And then finally, they hit upon this concept of psychological safety. And what they found was the teams that were the most productive and effective were the teams that had psychological safety, which means teams where people felt comfortable asking questions, where people felt like it was okay to mention, I'm having a rough time at home, right? Um, to admit that they'd made a mistake. Those were the teams that were by far the most effective. And in particular, um, what led to the strongest sense of psychological safety was when they had a team leader who had both the self-knowledge and the self-confidence to talk about his or her own challenges in life. So I know these guys don't want to do that, right? <laughs> but you can show them and I, I'm happy to send you the link to there was a great article that explains all of this and it shows the the team that they finally found that showed this is why this matters so much was a team where the guy shared his cancer diagnosis with his team members and when he did that what it did is it bonded the team so tightly right they all got to see like wow this is somebody who is trusting us with something very vulnerable about him and therefore we trust him and we are going to fight for him and I've seen this again and again. I have a, a friend who is, um, she's the head of litigation at a, a giant company, right? Like a fortune, I guess, 100 company. Um, so she's the head of, of litigation there. And her first day with her new team, she did something that she had done at her previous job, which is she came in and she said, um, listen, I know that we are all lawyers and investigators and paralegals and secretaries, but we are also parents and children and siblings and, and friends. And all of those roles matter and shape who we are, including at work. Um, and I think it will help us all if we can get to know each other a little bit better um, beyond just our bio. So I invite each of us, we're going to go around the table over a series of team meetings, and each person gets 30 minutes to share whatever they would like about themselves. And I'm going to go first. So this is her first day with her new team, right? She's like this big kind of tough guy lawyer, but she's going to stand up in front of everybody and talk for half an hour about her own background. And she shared her experience growing up as the child of immigrants. She shared her experience losing her brother at an early age. And because she modeled it, that it was okay to talk about these things when, as they worked their way around the table, other people shared their their experiences as being the first person in their family to go to college or their kind of religious journeys that they had gone through. Because the team had this bonding experience, that meant that when crisis later came, they leaned on each other instead of falling apart. So my friend's mother died unexpectedly, not you know too long after this happened. And she said, you guys, I'm not okay. I'm not gonna be able to, to be at full capacity for a little while now and I'm gonna to have to lean on you. And they said, of course, no problem. We are here and we will do whatever we can to support you. And COVID happened, right? And suddenly everybody is separated. Um, but instead of kind of falling apart, they all leaned in on each other because they had gotten to know each other in this deep way. And so when leaders are willing to engage on this level, the benefits are just astronomical. I mean, and I have, have a lot of stats on this in the book, but um, in terms of productivity, um, loyalty, absenteeism, creative um, problem solving, um, ability to withstand challenges, all of those things are enhanced 
when there is strong sense of trust and psychological safety in the team. So there is a lot of benefit if you can convince these guys and, and uh, definitely take the information from the book and maybe share with them the Google study. Um, but also remember that this is something where you can start just sitting right where you are by modeling it, by showing up for each other. And that can make a huge difference as well. We'll definitely send out after the program, probably tomorrow, the next, in the, within the next few days, we'll send out a link to that study to everyone. And we'll also send some other resources from, uh, from Catherine, if that's okay with you, Catherine, we'll get something out that will give people kind of a resource list because I think we all need this. Absolutely. You know, one thing I'd love you to just share with everybody, because what you did, you went from a very, from a secure, high level position in an organization where you could have just stayed there and you could feel safe, right? You know, you're going to get a salary. You're not going to, but you took a big risk and you went for your vision. Tell us a little bit about how you went about that. How did you get the courage and confidence to do that? Okay, well, let me be clear, it took a while. <laughs> you know, this was not like, oh, I have this great grand vision and then like, here I go. No, there was a lot of hand wringing. There was a lot of like fussing and, you know, trying to wiggle my way out of it. And I don't want to do this. And maybe this is a terrible idea. So let me be clear about that up front. Um, it was not a very, you know, linear path. Um, but there were a few things that helped. One is I did have a very, very clear vision of my mission. And I think it really, really helped to go through the Executive Women's Leadership Program because I could state it. I could just say it in a sentence. This is my vision. I can tell you right now, my vision is I am changing the way the world responds to victims, right? So I knew that I had this vision and I knew that it was not just DOJ, right? I wanted to I felt like I had done a lot at DOJ and I did. I know I made a big difference at DOJ and I'm really, really proud of the work that I did there. Um, but I also knew that I, I wanted something more than that. Um, one of the things, you know, this is, it was a great job and they were wonderful to me in, in kind of every way, but I did, I got kind of um, antsy, you know, I wasn't learning anymore. And I knew that it was fine. Like I wasn't doing anything wrong. But it got to the point where I not only knew all of the answers, like I knew all the questions, you know, somebody would call me with a question and before they've even finished their kind of spiel, I was like, okay, I just sent you an email with the three cases you need. Case number three has this little wrinkle. It doesn't apply in your case. So you're fine. Just give me a call back if you have any additional problems, <laughs> you know, like I just, I knew it all so well. And, and I, that's not the way I want to live my life. You know, I want to constantly be growing and learning and I could just kind of feel myself getting bored and smaller. And I really wanted, um, you know, I thought I've got, I've got a lot of career left, you know, I've got a lot of life left. I don't want to just rest on safe. I want to, I want to try for something. And so but I did a lot of practical things. So number one, I mean, the book sold before I left DOJ. Um, so that was one piece of it. I had already written the proposal, gotten an agent, sold the book before I left DOJ. We set aside my full, like a year's worth of my salary before I even gave notice, right? So we knew we had that in the bank. Um, and so if it took a while to ramp up, that was okay. Um, so we had plenty of money, you know, in the bank for that. Um, I am married and my wife was able to get health insurance for me. So I knew that some of these practical things were, were doable. Um, and then also I had um, a little cadre, you know, a, a group of friends who also had already done it. And I started having a monthly lunch with them. These were friends who had left steady, secure jobs to go out on their own. And they gave me practical advice and also the courage of getting to see like they did it, you know, and it maybe took a while, but they're fine. They're doing well. And, and it just made it even more um, tangible that it was something that somebody could do. Um, so, and then also got my wife on board with it, right? I mean, this is, it's gotta be a family decision. And so she was supportive of it and agreed that, you know, it was important that I do this and that if I didn't do it, 
I would regret it later. And so um, it took a long time. And I mean, I even like, I pushed back my leave date at DOJ like twice. I mean, I was definitely like kind of chicken about it. Um, but then finally it was time, it was just time to go. You know, I was ready and, um, you know, I can't ever tell anybody else when it is the right time for them. But um, for me, it, it was pretty clear that I had gotten there. All right, and you did it, you jumped. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, before we, we're going to go into the rooms, the breakout rooms, but before we do that, is there anything you want to share that you haven't already, uh, Kate? Um, let's see. I guess, you know, I just want to encourage everybody to, um, do what they can to hold on to these connections um, that you build through the Executive Women's Leadership Program. And if you haven't gone through that program, you should, um, but also just making sure that we're maintaining these connections um, because it's so important um, that we all are leaning on each other. Um, we all have just phenomenal dreams and visions and we all can help each other achieve them when we work together. So I guess that would be my, my final takeaway to you guys is just make sure that you are not neglecting the, the community aspect because I think it's really, really central. Yeah, and, and when you begin to reach your vision like you did, you've got all these people to support you to make it into a huge success. Yeah, yeah, oh my God, I've been so lucky. People have been so kind. Well, and it's not luck. I just want to point that out. <laughs> Not luck, because it happens because you do certain things. We go into action, we share, you know, we support each other, but yeah. we have to be in touch and know what everybody's visions are and goals are totally. in order to help each other. So you were very clear. You yeah. both <laughs> very clear about it. And that's, that's really important. Okay. So um, we're going to go into the rooms and the idea would be if when you go into your room, um, introduce yourself to the people that are in there with you, at least say your, your name and what you do. And um, Kate's gonna make the rounds, but if, there, if any of you have an issue that you wanna bring up to the group that you're with, there's a, a safe place to do it because the rule, we always have the rule of confidentiality wherever we are. So each group it's confidential in your own group that you'd ever share what you talk about, but it's a safe place to talk about it. So Katrina, can you begin to put us into, put everyone into uh, rooms?